to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. Mark chapter 5, verse number 19. Today we welcome you to our study about the gospel of Mark. We're in Mark chapters 5 through 8 where we're kind of right in the middle of where Jesus is doing miracles, he's teaching, he is impressing the crowds with his power and right up to the point where he's going to be ushered in to Jerusalem. And so we're glad that you've joined us for our study of the Gospel of Mark today. Hope you'll think more about tuning in with us through our lesson as we consider the power and the majesty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So stay tuned, have your Bible ready as we're gonna to look to these chapters together. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective play stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus is now introduced to a demoniac, a man who is possessed by multiplicity of demons. And this man, Legion by name, is one of the more unique stories in all the accounts of the life of Jesus. Jesus comes into the regions of the, of the Gadarenes, and as he is there, a man approaches him. And, and this man needs help. And the text goes on to tell us how bad this man's predicament is. He's out of his mind in some ways. Um, people have tried to catch him, and every time they catch him and they put shackles on him, he breaks the shackles. He lives among the graveyards and in the mountains. He cries out. He's hollering out all the time and, and cutting himself. And people are scared to death of this fella. So not only is it going to help this man, it, you'd think everybody in the surrounding region, it would help them as well. And so this man approaches Jesus. And I want you to notice what the Bible says in Mark chapter 5. The man comes to Jesus in Mark chapter 5 verse 10, begged him earnestly. The demons begged him earnestly. He would not send them out of the country. A large herd of swine were feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, 
send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once, listen to this, Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out, entered the swine. There were about 2,000. The herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. And those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the country and in the hillside. And the Bible says they all went out to see what had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they go on to tell what had happened. And they basically, because they're scared of Jesus, they invite him to leave their country, their hillside. Now, friend, I want you to think about here several things. This man's life before Jesus was an absolute mess. I mean, he's cutting himself. He is violent toward others. Anybody would come by, he'd probably attack them. He's just a wild man in many ways. His life was a mess before Jesus. But when Jesus enters the picture, he takes all these demons and casts them out of that man. He's sitting down. He's got his clothes on. He's in his right mind. His life's back in control. Friend, isn't that a, a beautiful picture of what the Lord can do for every person's life who is a mess. What about your life and mine? You know, I wasn't, my life wasn't a whole lot different than, demoniac, than the demoniacs and yours either before we came to Jesus. The things we were doing before Christ, those weren't helpful to us. We weren't probably talking or dressing or acting or doing the things that we should have been doing. The things we were doing were probably harmful to others and no doubt to ourselves. But when you come to Jesus, you're willing to fall down at his feet, submit to his will, let him take control of your life. Friend, look at the good. Look at the change. Look at the mess that's cleaned up and made right when you'll give your life to God and to Christ. What a beautiful picture this demoniac paints of anyone who's willing to submit their life to Jesus. And, and I want you to see how the demoniac feels and how Jesus feels about it. Mark chapter 5, look at what the Bible says in verse number 19. This man wants to follow Jesus around and go with him. And yet in verse 19, the Bible says, However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends. Tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he's had compassion on you. And so here's this man, no doubt, extremely grateful to have all those unclean spirits out of him, the legion of them. Hey, I want to go around with you. I want to travel around with you. I want, to, I want to be right there doing what you're doing. And Jesus said, you know, I've got a better job for you. Here's where you'll make more impact. I want you to go home to your friends, to your family, your friends, your neighbors. And I want you to tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, how he's had compassion on you. What about this man's parents? What about his siblings? What about his friends maybe he ran around with when he was little? What about the community that he lived in that knows this man was a wild, crazy man that if you saw walking down the street, you run as fast as you could the other way. And now here he is. He was a living testimony to the power, the compassion, and the mercy of Jesus Christ. What's the Lord want of me and you? When the Lord cleans up the mess that's in my life and yours, what's he want me and you to do? Same thing. I want you to go home to your friends, the people, the circle of trust and influence that you have and people you know. Live right, act right, talk right, do right, let your life be changed, and it's those people. Go home to your friends and neighbors. When they say, what happened to you? You talk different, you act different, you live different, you kind of have things together now. Show them what the Lord's done for you. Tell them about God and Jesus and his majesty and power and how that can change your life in every way. And so in Mark chapter 5, Jesus now will heal uh, Jairus' daughter. You've got the example of some of the healings of Jesus here in Mark 5 and 6. He heals Jairus' daughter just by saying the word. There is that woman who has had a flow of blood 
all her life. She spent every dime she had. She goes to a multiplicity of doctors, and she didn't get any better. She got worse. She touched Jesus' garment, made just like that. The healings, the miracles, the raisings. Well, what's all that prove? the power of Jesus, his majesty, that he is king of kings and lord of lords. There's nothing he can't do and how wonderful it is to be a child of God. But friend, I don't want you to think that there aren't going to be challenges in the Christian life as well. Let's illustrate that. Mark chapter 6. We began in the gospel of Mark introducing very briefly John the baptizer. John was a great servant of God. His job was to prepare the way of Jesus and move aside. He said, I'm not even worthy to buckle, to tie the shoes on his feet in essence. And he did a great job doing that. But now John is going to be put in prison because he stood up for what's right. John is actually going to give his life because of the strong teaching he did. And so we have Herod here, we have Philip, He's married his brother's wife. Uh, the wife and the daughter evidently hate John. There's this big party. They come before the king. Uh, the, 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 the daughter dances in such a way that it pleases everybody there in that state of mind. And so he says, hey, I'm going to give you whatever you want, up to half the kingdom. And because she hates John and what he stood for so much, she says, I want the head of John the Immerser on a platter. King doesn't want to do it. That's not what he wants. But because of his word, he had to. But what is it that cost John his life? Look in Mark chapter 6, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in Mark chapter 6. And I want you to notice John's talked to the people here, and he, he basically says, you're not doing right. You're not living right. Verse 17, for Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John, bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her because John said to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Friend, living the Christian life is the best thing ever. You've got the hope and the joy of life after this life, but we don't want to mislead somebody by saying that there aren't going to be challenges and difficulties and that, that there isn't going to be persecution for standing up for what's right. When we talk about God's plan of salvation, when we say what God says about morality, marriage, divorce, homosexuality, the woke ideas of today, the whole LGBTQ things that are contrary to God, when we stand up for what's right on marriage or whatever it may be, there may be persecution. But friend, God always takes care of his own and ultimately we have the promise of living one day in heaven with God. Listen carefully. Why? Why did John, all he had to do was backtrack. Yeah, you can go ahead and marry her, even though it's probably not quite right. You can go ahead and marry her. Why did John not just backtrack on that? Well, friend, let me explain to you why John didn't. Because this life is the temporary side. What we're doing right now is to prepare us for eternity. If John tells him he can have his brother's wife and keep living in that ungodly marital situation, John loses out on eternal life. John hadn't stood true to the Lord. And friend, when, when, when we compromise to the woke ideas, when we give in to what society or Hollywood may want us to do today, it isn't about here and now. It's all about what's going to happen on the others. Living faithful to God for the other side. My friend, that's what it's all about. And so there may be persecution. There may be challenges. But it's all going to be worth it on the other side. This is the short side. We're headed toward the long side. Live in view of eternity. And God will take care of the rest. Then I want you to look in Mark chapter 6 at a simply amazing event in the life of Jesus. As we think about the power and the majesty of Jesus, nothing illustrates that power greater than his ability to suspend the natural laws and control the elements. Who can do that but God, right? Look in Mark 6 verse 45. The Bible says immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, go before him to the other side to Bethsaida. Well, 
while he sent the multitude away. And when he sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now at the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed by them. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But he immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves because of the hardness of their heart. Now, I want you to put yourself in the mind of, of Jesus' disciples. Out on the sea, you left Jesus up in the mountain praying. It's the middle of the night. It's dark. Whatever means of light you've got, I promise you, isn't very good. They had heard all these sailors' tales about the sea creatures, maybe, and the, the, the phantoms and the ghosts. And they're out in the middle of the sea, and they look up, and a figure is coming toward them. I wonder what you would have done. I wonder what I would have done in that situation. I imagine I'd have been pretty afraid too, right? They look up. They're terrified. They think it's a ghost. And Jesus says, calm down, everybody. Don't be afraid. It is I. Be of good cheer. Now, what's the point of all that? Who can come out to people on a boat walking on the water like that? Who can control the elements? Who can suspend the natural laws of gravity? Who can walk on water and not sink? Well, for that's the whole idea. When we talk in the book of Mark about the majesty of Christ and his power, he has the ability to control the elements, to suspend the natural laws only because he made those laws. He controls them. All things were made by Him, through Him, and for Him. John 1, 1 through 4. All things exist because He holds them up by His power. Colossians 1, verses 15 through 18. This event, as much as any in the Bible, shows the majesty and the power of Jesus. And when Jesus, in Mark chapter 6, verse number 50 says, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Friend, at the disciples of Jesus, that had to stick in their mind. Let me illustrate it this way. They're going to face a lot of challenges in the days coming. In the book of Acts, there's going to be persecution on top of persecution on top of persecution. Their life, at times, is going to feel like they're out in that boat and they're terrified and they're fearful and don't know what's going to happen. Jesus calmed every fear. He allayed every problem. He took care of every difficulty. When they put their trust in Christ, be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Friend, doesn't that remind us of a very powerful truth as well? Life's not always going to be smooth sailing. You're going to have difficulties and challenges. Sometimes our life's going to feel like we're going to feel afraid and we don't know what's going on. But friend, here's, here's what you do need to know. Remember this truth. Hebrews 13, verses 5 through 7. The scripture says, Let your life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Why? For God himself has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, so that you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? In times when our life is fearful, uh, we're afraid, it's tumultuous, it's problematic. Just remember, Jesus can help us. God can help us. And being a Christian, more than anything, is worth living faithful to God every day. Now I want to direct your attention to Mark chapter 7. Jesus is going to go into the temple area. And in Mark chapter 7, he's going to run across some very, very pious, hard-hearted ungodly people. Mark chapter 7, Jesus is going to be asked, why do, your, why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? They don't wash, they don't cleanse up to the, they don't take care of the couch, they don't do all these traditions that the religious people of today have. And Jesus will say, well, let me ask you something also. Why do you break the commandments of God? 
There's one tradition of men, you're breaking the commandments of God. Don't you know that kind of set them back? Oh, what do you mean? Well, you've got this magic word, don't you? Korban, uh, the scriptures teach, even your Old Testament scripture teaches, in your old age, it is your response, or in your parents' old age, it is your responsibility to honor father and mother and, and set aside and take care of them. But you've got this word where everything that you've set aside to take care of mom and dad, you can say the magic word, Korban. Mom and dad, are, you're relinquished to that responsibility to take care of them, and if you give it all to the temple, that's all good and well. Look at what Jesus said about that in Mark chapter 7. Jesus says in verses six through nine, he answered and said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, and as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. He said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Now notice what verse 13 says. By saying this magic word, Korban, you are making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you've handed down, and many such things as you do. Friend, here we have a conflict. It's a conflict of the ages. There is the conflict between this is what God says, this is what the law of God teaches, and here is our tradition. You know what Jesus said? Put your tradition aside. Lay that down. Give that up. You are rejecting the will of God. You are living like hypocrites. You're, putting the, you're making the commandment of God null and void by your tradition. What about today? The people put tradition above the word of God. Well, our tradition says we ought to do this religiously. Our tradition, the Bible may not say it, but our tradition says we can go to services on Saturday night and take the communion then. Our tradition says we can have a man set up in a position of power, go into a little cubicle and say, Father, forgive me, I've sinned. Where's that? The Bible says, call no man father. What's all that about? Well, that's tradition. Wait a minute now. I once talked to a fellow involved in religious error, and he said, he said, Ben, here's what you don't understand. He said, you don't understand our source of authority. We have three sources of authority. We have tradition, we have the Bible, and we have oral history. And I thought, wait a minute now, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible still says, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. Do sometimes we let our tradition get in the way of doing right and following God? Key verse, as we mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 7, verse 37. What a beautiful picture. Jesus has done many great miracles. The deaf can hear. Jesus has healed the deaf man. The mute can speak. Those who couldn't talk came to Jesus and they left talking. Those who couldn't hear came to Jesus and they left hearing. And look at that, that thematic idea of the majesty of Christ. Mark 7, 37. Jesus has done all things well. Friend, you talk about a uh, one verse statement, one sentence statement that epitomizes the life of Jesus, that's it. He's done all things well. Makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Friend, when I think about Christ, I think about the majesty of his life, I think about the power of it, but I also think about the perfection of it. Tempted, all points as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15. He had to be made like his brethren so that he could be a faithful and merciful high priest. Hebrews 2 verses 14 through 18. He committed no sin, nor was guile or deceit ever found in his mouth. And now as we enter into Mark chapter 8, we're kind of brought up to a climax, to a, to a decision point, if you will. We've been hearing and seeing about the power of Jesus through his miracles. His teaching has impressed our hearts with the power and the, the, the effort of that and the good that he's done. We know by this point, as we've read the story, that Jesus is greater than Satan. Only he could do those things because God is with him and he is God. Now in Mark chapter 8, probably one of the biggest questions that's ever been asked in the gospel accounts and in my and your life, 
is asked. Look in Mark chapter 8. I think these rhetorical questions are questions that you cannot dismiss flippantly. Look in Mark chapter 8. And I want you to look at what Jesus asked in Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. Jesus says in verse 35, Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. He's trying to get the point that you've got to make 100% completion commitment to him. Now look in verse 36 and 37. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul. Jesus reminds us of what our most valuable possession is and how to take care of it. A lot of people put a lot of value in different possessions. If you've got a home, you're gonna do whatever you can to ensure and take care of that. You see people take a lot of effort and put a lot of value in their cars, gold, jewelry, bank accounts, whatever it may be. Friend, that's not, all that's gonna perish with the using. What's your most valuable possession? What's the one thing you have that is worth more than anything else? Well, Jesus tells us, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Friend, you have, a, you have an eternal soul. That soul is given to you by God. That soul is going to live beyond this life. The Spirit's going to return to God who gave it, and you're going to live, I'm going to live somewhere forever. The what, what I do in this life determines where my spirit lives. Don't get all caught up in the stuff and the junk of this world. Instead, we need to focus on what really matters. Friend, have you obeyed the gospel? Have you submitted to the power and majesty of Jesus? Do you believe he's the son of God? John chapter 8, verse 24. Would you turn from a life of sin in repentance to Jesus? Acts 3, 19. Would you confess him and his power and his majesty before men? Romans 10, verse 10. And would you, to have your sins washed away, be immersed in water, Acts 2, 38, for the forgiveness of your sins and live faithful to Jesus every day? If you've not done that, we beg you to. And friend, we hope you'll join us next time as we study more from the majesty of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, and downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the Gospel of Christ.